Okay, everyone, welcome to this uh, session. Let's first make sure that you can hear me. So I don't know uh, if you can chat now, just to confirm that you can hear as well. Uh, if someone could confirm, even... Uh, they can hear you. They can hear us, okay, excellent. So, uh, welcome everyone. Um, this is the first uh, session uh, of this public health uh, online lecture series. Um, thank you very much for joining us. It is a great pleasure to be launching this, uh, this initiative. Uh, myself and um, uh, my dear colleague, uh, Dr. Theodore Lidras. Uh, it is uh, an initiative that is under the the auspices of the PhD in public health, uh, as well as the Master of Public Health at European University uh, Cyprus. Uh, I will make a very brief um, introduction to the lecture series, and then I will give uh, the floor to Dr. Lietras, who will introduce our uh, first uh, guest lecturer. So, um, uh, as I can see from, uh, from the participants panel, we have a lot of students from the PhD, from the MPH. I'm pretty sure some names I'm not aware of are from the medical school and other uh, programs. So this is really great uh, for us. And because uh, the main purpose of this lecture series is uh, uh, to introduce uh, the scientific community here in Cyprus, as well as our students, of course, first of all, to um, uh, the, the science and art of public health, as we <laughs> tend to call it. Um, the main aim of this lecture series is essentially to create a community. This is one of the aims that myself and uh, Luther, uh have, uh, as you know, we have been recently uh, uh, been recruited in uh, at the university. We have started both in September. So one of our aims, our vision, is to make uh, to create a, a, a community uh, here at European University, which will be centered around public health and, uh, of course, public health research. So it is great to see uh, so many of you. Um, Regarding the lecture series, as you will see uh, in a few minutes when Theodore will be introducing our first uh, guest, we will do our best to invite people uh, who are experts uh, on the field. And, and we feel really, really honored to have uh, our first uh, lecturer who, as Theodore will uh, tell you, is a, is a really uh, world-known um, uh, academic in public health. And of course, we will do our best to keep up with that and uh, expose you, if you like. It's a, it's a word we tend to use in, in epidemiology, expose you to uh, several more uh, experts. You will have the opportunity to interact with them uh, at the end, to ask questions, and, and we are sure they will be more than happy to answer your questions. Generally, we try to expand this initiative, we open it to the public, and uh, we try to have an international uh, orientation. A, a main problem with uh, um, generally research in, in Cyprus is that it's very kind of close-minded, if I may, uh, so it's not so much open, uh, internationally oriented, so this is something that we will try to enhance as much as possible here at the European University, and I believe this is a great start. So uh, this is uh, my short uh, introduction. Welcome again. We are really happy to have you with us. And uh, I give the floor to uh, Dr. Litras, who will uh, introduce our first uh, guest. Thank you very much for joining, and we will be with you um, for questions at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Heraklidis. Uh, my name is uh, Theodor Litras. I'm an assistant professor uh, of public health at the uh, EUC School of Medicine. 
And uh, tonight uh, we are launching this uh, regular series of uh, state-of-the-art guest lectures in public health with a very, very special guest. He is a paragon of evidence-based medicine and meta-research. He is one of the most influential and highly, highly cited scientists worldwide. Most of you will know his uh, famous uh, thought-provoking article, Why Most Published Research Findings Are False, especially my students will have heard of it, uh, which is the most downloaded article in the history of Public uh, Library of Science with millions of downloads. He was trained at, uh, in internal medicine and infectious diseases at Harvard, Harvard and Tufts, held positions at the National Institutes of Health, Johns Hopkins and Tufts, before coming in a small rural town in northwestern Greece called Ioannina, to chair the Department of Epidemiology there and inspiring a whole generation of young doctors and scientists many of whom are having uh, productive clinical and academic careers around the world. He is currently at Stanford University with multiple academic and honorary appointments and also a recipient of multiple career awards, far too numerous to mention. And he's tonight with, with us for this unique inaugural lecture, lecture in this series. So I'm honored and pleased to present to you my teacher, Professor John P. A. Ioannidis. The floor is yours. Thank you for the very kind invitation, uh, Thodoris, and uh, thank you uh, all of you for joining uh, tonight. Uh, so uh, Thodoris suggested that I should talk about evidence-based public health, and my first reaction to that, well, that's a great title. Um, maybe the lecture could last less than a minute. I could tell people that evidence-based public health is dead, we should all go home and uh, this is over. <laughs> um, I have wondered whether this is the case and uh, perhaps it's not completely dead. Over the last uh, uh, year, I think that uh, we have seen uh, a lot of uh, the interface between evidence-based public health and the repercussions that this can have. And this has probably challenged some of the conventions that uh, we have had about evidence-based medicine, evidence-based public health or evidence-based X. Traditionally, evidence-based public health is asking for the best evidence and applying it in, in ways that there's shared decision-making with those who are, would be affected and in ways that we will get the most benefit and the least harm. Uh, we have a history of having pyramids, uh, which sometimes work, sometimes they do not, and placing randomized evidence, randomized controlled trials at the top, along with their meta-analysis and systematic reviews, and placing experts and tweets at the bottom. So you have observational data uh, that are very close to experts. Uh, experts and tweets are pretty much the desert around the pyramid. But in the last year, I think we have seen that experts without data and tweets, you know, the blogosphere and uh, the Twitter sphere uh, have become so dominant that they're driving lots of very important public health decisions. Several years ago, I, I uh, I, I created some trouble when I said that evidence-based medicine um, has been hijacked. It was a report to my late mentor, uh, David Sackett, where I argued that unfortunately evidence-based medicine has become so successful at last, after many decades of trying since it was uh, originating from, uh, from David Sackett's and uh, uh, other people uh, like uh, Gordon Wyatt and McMaster in the early 1990s, that unfortunately it has been hijacked. Why was that? Well, um, the, the key tool of non-evidence-based medicine and public health, I, I use these terms interchangeably uh, during the lecture, back in 1990, they were splendidly serving vested interests and they included ectothedra pronouncements by prestigious opinion leaders in various conferences, editorials, non-systematic reviews, professional society guidelines done for the glory of the profession, pamphlets from drug reps, and other marketing material disseminated in medical scientific meetings. Moving forward to 2021, the key tools of still non-evidence-based medicine and public health, their guidelines that are based on seemingly rigorous but still partisan processes, systematic reviews and meta-analysis, sadly too many and too poor most of the time, randomized trials, sadly very often conflicted, observational studies and risk factor epidemiology, wow, that's meet the bias, the works, personalized precision dreams with precision medicine and precision public health, dreams and nightmares, I would say, and I'll show you why, 
modeling meets speculation at its worst, and we've seen the worst in the last year, and what I call public health tyrannies that are evolving very rapidly. Evidence certainly is less than optimal. We, I mean, we all want the best evidence, but we often come across pyramids that have been completely destroyed, and sometimes we might find out why they're destroyed. Uh, in the past, I used to have that slide of a bulldozed pyramid by property developers, and I would say the reason for the destruction is money. So I would say money, 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 but now I'm switching this to money, allegiance, or zealotry. And I think all of these are very prominent in the demise of evidence-based public health. So randomized trials. Do we have randomized trials in public health decisions, in decision-making? We have a database, uh, COVID evidence, that uh, we have launched uh, uh, jointly with uh, uh, my colleague and, and former student, Lars Hemkins, uh, the University of Basel, where he's the deputy director of epidemiology um, and uh, clinical epidemiology and biostatistics. There's 2,840 trials of pharmaceutical interventions done in the last uh, year, uh, launched or, or registered for COVID-19 related issues. There's only four trials of non-pharmaceutical interventions that would pertain to what I would call more like public health issues. This is a, a paper that uh, I published uh, several months ago with uh, uh, Joanna Cristea and Floriano Det, uh, where we said we, we need more of those. We need more trials of public health interventions like social distancing interventions or things that make such a huge impact in our daily lives that we try to apply that are changing our world. Is it impossible to do that? Well, people, smart people like Teresa Greenhall um, at Oxford says that, well, it cannot be done. That's the end of evidence-based medicine. Now, COVID-19 has told us that we should just forget about it. It cannot be done. PICO, the standard approach of population intervention comparison outcome, cannot be applied. Randomized trials have horrible deficiencies. They take forever to be done. They cannot be done. Uh, just forget it. Evidence-based medicine is a nuisance. That's very interesting because Trisha really made a career out of publishing a popular book about applying evidence-based medicine. I mean, she, she never had like a methodological career. You know, suddenly she becomes the arbitrator of methods and throwing down uh, whatever made her previous career. Th that's, that's wonderful. That's, uh, that's a way to uh, reinvent yourself, I guess. But I'm wondering, should we just give up? Should we just say that we just pass over evidence uh, to hmm, I don't know, speculators uh, to politicians uh, to modelers with no data or poor data or horrible data and uh, just go home. Uh, I'm not sure. I think that, that the fact that uh, you cannot have PICO in public health interventions is not true. I mean, you can have populations, you can have interventions and understanding interventions and their dosing. You can have timing and duration of the interventions. You can have aspects of sequencing and continuation, enforcement of adherence, weaning process. You can have outcomes. Goodness, you should have outcomes and also measures to see uh, how things work. And you can also have populations, target groups, settings, uh, and comparisons. Uh, so you can have all of that. And I would argue that you have to be very careful in thinking about what outcomes you're interested in, in any public health intervention. You need to think also about how and when you measure these outcomes what kind of data you're going to collect, uh, what will be the long-term relevance, much like uh, in a medication trial, you worry or you do want to know about the long-term uh, benefits and harms, what is the cost effectiveness, and how do you place in context uh, to broader gains and, and risks? Well, the alternative is that we just resort to observational approaches. And I have nothing against observational epidemiology. I have done a lot of observational epidemiology, I'm sure that I have published a lot of papers that probably will not be replicated and some others that may be okay. But the problem is that much of observational epidemiology, unfortunately, has the, or fortunately, has the benefit of being unbound, of having no rules. And that means that while we are exploring, almost any result can be obtained. Uh, this is what I call the vibration of effects phenomenon and the Janus phenomenon from the Greek Roman god who could see in two opposite directions. Uh, and these are data from a, a very mature database, the National Household Survey in uh, the US. Uh, uh, you have representative samples of the US populations being sampled and you have measurements on lots of things. Uh, so you can test lots of associations. And uh, 
uh, one association that we're testing here on the far right panel is between vitamin E levels, uh, alpha tocopherol, and the risk of death. Uh, so you see uh, a plot that has the log minus log 10 p-values against uh, the hazard ratio, and there's about 1 million points there. Why 1 million points? Because we have run testing for that association with 1 million different analyses. There's 1 million different ways to analyze the question, is vitamin E related to increased or decreased mortality risk? Uh, and about 700 of these analyses suggest that vitamin E decreases the risk of death. About 300 of these analyses suggest that it increases the risk of death. So you can pick and choose. If you have no rules, if you have no pre-specification, if you have not told people exactly what you're going to do, you can have 1 million different ways to analyze the data. How do you do that? Well, you can choose whether to include or not include 19 covariates. There's at least 19 things that affect the risk of death, and you can get any result that you want. Bradford Hill was a very thoughtful person, and uh, uh, back in the mid-1960s, he came up with these nine famous criteria, which actually uh, he never called criteria of causality himself, but they have been established as the criteria for causality and, and causation. And, and, and in fact, uh, this is not really uh, the case. Um, if, if you look at what he wrote, he said none of these criteria is really bulletproof. Uh, each one of them may have some deficiencies, so you need to consider it, but you have to be very careful about what it says. And if you look at these criteria very carefully, this is what I tried to do in the Bradford Hill lecture uh, five years ago. It was the 50-year celebration at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. I, I concluded that in the current environment, most of these criteria do not really work, or they work very um, Partially, they, they work sometimes, they work under some circumstances. Um, perhaps experiment works, uh, which is practically randomized trials, but even that has been challenged. Even people who believed in randomized trials have attacked randomized trials. So uh, what am I going to say? You know, nothing is really fully bulletproof. Modeling, which has become highly dominant in public health and uh, both science and uh, uh, decision-making is unfortunately even worse. Uh, many months ago, we published that paper in the International Journal of Forecasting saying that forecasting for COVID-19 has failed. And it's not just COVID-19. I think that modeling and trying to make predictions, especially about non-static phenomena, is extremely, extremely difficult. But why is that? There's multiple reasons. Data tend to be poor. You can have poor data input on key features uh, of what you're trying to model, in this case, the pandemic. Uh, and that goes into very theory-heavy uh, based forecasting. The, the poor data can also affect data-based uh, forecasting. Um, many of the assumptions tend to be very speculative and tenuous, and they can be obviously wrong, especially if you accumulate more evidence, you realize that many of the assumptions are completely off. Estimates can have very high sensitivity. Um, key epidemiological features tend to be ignored in many of the models. Uh, I, I, I think that modeling in public health has been uh, invaded by people who have absolutely no clue about public health, have no clue about medicine for sure, uh, they have no clue about epidemiology, to be honest. And this means that even if you have tremendous risk gradients, like in the case of COVID-19, we have more than a thousand-fold difference in risk if you're talking about an 80-year-old, especially with comorbidities, versus a 10-year-old child, this is completely ignored because you have people who are very competent in modeling, but completely incompetent in anything else that is relevant to the question. Poor past evidence on effects of available interventions. So if, if you think about doing systematic reviews, sometimes these systematic reviews end up with the uh, empty set, or they end up with data that go back to 1918, when uh, data collection, data quality, and data recording was, uh, if it's horrible now, you can think what it was back in 1918. Lack of transparency, errors. I, I, I have seen errors in my own modeling. It's not easy to avoid errors, especially with complex models. Lack of determinacy, uh, looking at only one or a few dimensions of the problem at a time. Uh, this is very common. You know, People just look at cases, for example, or hospitalizations. They ignore that there's dozens of other things that public health is interested in we should be interested about mental health, about acute diseases that are not treated, about chronic uh, prevention that is disrupted, 
about suicides, about zillions of other things that are not really included in the same model to give us a holistic picture. Lack of expertise in crucial disciplines, as I mentioned before, group thing and, and bandwagon effects. Some, some of these teams are very powerful and once they publish something, especially in a major journal, everyone needs to fit to that paradigm. And finally, extensive selective reporting. Models are the, the worst of all in terms of selective reporting. There's absolutely no pre-registration. There's no transparency on what is going to be done. You just report whatever you want and whatever really fits your narrative. Specialties have grown both in medicine and uh, in uh, public health. Uh, uh, everyone has become a specialist. And this is good if you think about uh, uh, the need to have people who are extra experts in, in specific sub-sub-disciplines. But I'm wondering whether this is saving public health or actually just maximizing the clientele and creating an inner structure with bandwagon effects. We, we see that very often experts tend to maximize the importance of their own expertise, leaving everything thing out if it's not relevant to what they do. So we see a lot of disease monitoring in many medical and public health specialties. We see broader definition of disease and illness, treatable range, for example, what is hypercholesterolemia, what is hypertension, what is metabolic syndrome and, and prediabetes. Um, Experts try to show that they're dealing with a serious problem, and they are dealing with serious problems, but sometimes they're making these problems more serious than they really are. Worse, experts from different specialties, even those dealing with the same condition, rarely communicate with each other. This is uh, one example from the treatment of uh, basal cell carcinoma. It's the most common cancer, uh, practically, and uh, there's two schools. There's the school of uh, using aggressive surgical uh, or uh, um, intrusive uh, treatments uh, and the, the school of, of using uh, conservative uh, treatments. So medical dermatology versus surgical dermatology. They have their own societies, they have their own journals, they have their own uh, little worlds, but they very rarely communicate with each other. And this can be shown here. These are all the mice trials that have been done for treatment of basal cell carcinoma. Uh, Nodes are treatments, and you see the group of the conservative ones at the uh, bottom left, and you have the aggressives and the surgeons, uh, uh, surgical treatments on the uh, on, on the other side. Uh, if you see connections, it means that uh, there's uh, randomized comparisons, and you see that there's only two little connections between the two worlds. So, the, so some lesions probably are amenable only to one type of treatment, but the vast majority of the uh, uh, lesions that are being treated here are such that we would like to know whether it's medical, better to go down a medical path uh, or a surgical path, but we don't really know which one is best. A sad realization is that evidence-based medicine or public health is widely tolerated only when it can produce mostly boring evidence reports that can be endorsed by experts and or serve vested interests of one or more clans. Uh, clans, uh, until recently, tended to be just uh, uh, scientific ones. Uh, increasingly, they become also non-scientific. Uh, so they, they could be marketing, they could be uh, political, they could be any sort of clan that has served, uh, uh, that is, wants vested interest to be served. The very same people who were previously spitting when mentioning evidence-based medicine uh, when this whole business started are now using the very same term to buttress their eminence-based medicine claims to prestige by misusing the tools of evidence-based medicine. Systematic reviews and meta-analysis have become dominant, but have they really helped? I, I'm, I'm sad to say that most of them have not really helped. Uh, we have seen uh, the growth of these tools to become a pandemic uh, with exponential growth uh, over time. Uh, these are data until uh, five years ago. It has continued to become even more prominent. We have over 100,000 meta-analysis that have been published to date. And unfortunately, many of them just tell us very little or tell us something that is misleading. The worst situation is when meta-analysis become just marketing tools. For example, this is what we saw for meta-analysis evaluating antidepressants for depression. Uh, we found 185 Medline listed meta-analysis on that topic published over six years. Only 58 of the 185 um, had any negative statements in the concluding statement of the abstract and actually the strongest risk factor for having just favorable uh, comments uh, was 
having an author uh, who is uh, an employee of the manufacturer. Uh, if that were the case, uh, you had 22 times less likely to have uh, negative statements about the drug than other meta-analysis. In fact, only one of 54 such meta-analysis had any negative statement, and I, I bet these authors do not work for that company any longer. This is what the meta pie looks like. Uh, this is uh, 100 uh, meta-analysis. Uh, you would get about 20 of them or a bit less that are left unpublished. You will get uh, lots of uh, flawed beyond repaired meta-analysis. You will get many redundant and unnecessary. You will get uh, a lot of misleading uh, meta-analysis, uh, specifically around abandoned candid gene genetics. Uh, you have some, you know, perhaps uh, 15 to 20 percent that are decent but not really useful. The questions that they ask and they try to answer are not really of any importance or any portent. And you have about 3% or less that are both decent, well done, and clinically useful. So, so it's uh, getting more and more difficult to isolate that 3% and be able to learn from that. It's not just meta-analysis. Most research, most applied research, clinical research, and I would add public health research. When I wrote that paper, I had clinical research in mind, but I can easily add public health to that same title, is not useful. And, and why is that? Um, many reasons. There's eight features that, to me, would make uh, uh, research uh, useful. Problem-based, content displacement, information gain, pragmatism, patient-centeredness, value for money, feasibility, and transparency. Is there a problem? Or are we creating a problem and then trying to, to solve it, but it doesn't exist? Have we sought what is the prior evidence on the topic? Uh, so be able to really put things in context. Uh, designing something that will give us sufficient information, regardless of what the result is going to be. It, it could be a quote-unquote positive result, it could be a negative result, are we going to learn out of this? Is that reflecting real life? This is particularly important in public health. If it does not reflect real life, you know, what, what, what do we care? Have we asked patients? Have we asked people? Have we asked healthy people? Have we asked citizens, if it's for public health measures, what is their top priorities, or are we doing that in vacuum? Is the research worth the money? Is the intervention worth the money? Uh, is the intervention worth the side effects uh, or the adverse effects in terms of people killed by the intervention sometimes when it comes to public health interventions. Visibility, can it be done? Even, even randomized trials are often abandoned. You know, some fields like surgical randomized trials, about 40% have to be abandoned because of uh, futility. And finally, are the methods, the data, and the analysis verifiable and unbiased? How many studies of those circulating in the literature fulfill these criteria? Very, very few. Even if you go to major journal, medical journals like New England Journal of Medicine and Lancet and JAMA, most studies just fulfill a small subset of these criteria. And I have to say, these journals are just publishing about 1% of the total literature. So you have that 99% that fulfills even fewer criteria, but even that 1% in the top journals really misses the point much of the time. This is an empirical evaluation looking across the entire Cochrane database of systematic reviews over a year and a half. We had about 1,400 topics uh, that were assessed with systematic reviews. About half of them, a bit less, had been appraised by grade, grades of assess recommendation, assessment, development, and evaluation. And we saw that uh, um, the remaining mostly had no evidence to appraise, and this is why grade was not applied. The quality of the evidence for the first listed primary outcome was high only 13.5% of the time. Uh, even when all outcomes listed were considered, only 19% had at least one outcome with high quality of evidence. And if you asked how many of these 1394 systematic reviews, how many of these topics had high quality of evidence, statistically significant results, and a favorable interpretation of the intervention, we had only 25, which is less than 2%. Less than 2% of a, a, a random or close to random set of interventions had all of that in place, which would be the optimal scenario. We repeated that exercise and published the results uh, uh, less than a year ago. Uh, it's still the same. Uh, over the last uh, uh, five, six years, uh, things have not really improved. Patient relevance um, is not sought. Uh, this is uh, data from preterm uh, infants and interventions for preterm delivery. This is the one field 
where evidence-based medicine started. This is uh, where Ian Chalmers and uh, other uh, frontrunners of evidence-based medicine started performing systematic reviews. So it's the most sensitized field, the most advanced field in a sense, in terms of understanding why evidence-based medicine is important. Nevertheless, when we did an empirical evaluation, we found that only a small minority of these trials are including the most relevant, patient-relevant outcomes in their design, let alone in their reporting. Conflicts. Conf conflicts are, are also a, a major problem. And as I said at the very beginning, um, conflicts, of course, are financial very often, and uh, they can make a huge difference. But in many public health issues, conflicts may also be allegiance biases. They may be uh, issues where someone has a very strong opinion, has built a career, is building a career, so around a specific hypothesis, specific finding, a specific uh, gestalt, and then uh, instead of just remaining within science, uh, that person becomes an advocate. I, th I think that we need to separate between science and advocacy. I have nothing against advocacy. I think that there's so many great causes to advocate for, you know, climate change, tobacco, and public health. We need advocates. But you need to be able to separate what is advocacy and, and what is science and uh, disclose uh, what is being said. Uh, sometimes there is a mix of advocacy with financial um, conflicts. For example, some advocates uh, are writing books that become bestsellers and they become millionaires or you know, they get lots of money from uh, what they have published. Uh, this is then a financial conflict. If you have published a book that says that uh, this diet that uh, is named after uh, me uh, is uh, what is going to save your life and you're making a million dollars out of that, well, that's worse than having uh, a pharma uh, industry giving you $50,000, isn't it? We have randomized trials in many public health related issues. I shouldn't be so critical about the lack of, of randomized evidence. For example, we have randomized trials for lifestyle interventions. Uh, most of these interventions are not regulated. Many of these trials, most of these trials are not registered. Even when they're registered, they're very hazy, they're very vague about what exactly they're studying and how exactly they're going to run the analysis. So uh, statistical analysis plans are almost never to be seen in these trials. So are, are these trials an advancement over the modeling chaos and the observational completely exploratory approach? Not much unless you really have what these randomized trial strengths would be, which is securing randomization and also making sure that uh, you will get uh, some solid pre-registration and pre-specification of the outcomes. There are additional considerations. There are many uh, cases where you have very strong location effects. We, we have randomized trials that are conducted in countries that have very limited expertise in running randomized experimentation. In an empirical evaluation that uh, we published in BMJ several years ago, we found that uh, these trials done in less developed countries on average inflated benefit for mortality outcomes by about 15% compared to those that were done in more developed countries. This is one example. We have multiple trials in European and uh, countries in the US. Uh, they don't really show any benefit for that intervention. And you have a small trial done in China that shows a huge benefit from the intervention. Recently, I wrote an editorial about uh, uh, zombie trials. And, and the incentive for that was a, a paper by John Carlyle, who was an editor of anesthesiology and was asking to receive the raw data, the individual level data for all the trials that were being considered for publication in the journal. He concluded that about 40% of the trials were zombies. The data were completely impossible. Uh, for example, you had entire columns being copied in two different places in the spreadsheets. That could never really happen statistically. It would happen once in a trillion. What does this mean? Uh, it means that we have to be very careful if we just say we want randomized trials. Randomized trials need to be done carefully. They need to be done in a valid way. They need to be done in a way that they would be trustworthy. Real world evidence. Pragmatism. Um, randomized trials, most of the time, they're not pragmatic, and this is where they're being attacked by many of their critics. Uh, uh, you have tools like Precise 2 that has been developed, is looking at 
different domains like eligibility, recruitment, setting, organization, flexibility um, of delivery and adherence, follow-up, primary outcome and primary analysis. Many trials are claiming to be pragmatic, real world, but if you look very carefully, actually, they're not. What is the motivations then for trying to get pragmatic evidence with other means other than uh, randomized trials? Well, uh, a very common invocation is that we want to see what's happening in the real world. But if you look carefully, even for wrong randomized studies, it's not really what's happening in the real world that is being studied. You have very select circumstances. You have very problematic circumstances that are very difficult to generalize in the real world uh, in most of these cases. Uh, when uh, we looked at uh, a set of studies with routinely collected data across the board, we found uh, a sample of 337 routinely collected data dependent studies, uh, and very rarely the investigators could make a good claim that it would be unethical or difficult to uh, contact uh, randomized trials uh, on these topics. We also have empirical evidence in comparing uh, randomized trials versus studies with routinely collected data. This is from a paper we published six years ago in the BMJ, and we saw that on average, when you have some data from randomized uh, uh, data collection uh, analyzed with a propensity score, for example, which is uh, you know one one method, uh, propensity methods to try to take into account for imbalances and for the preference of people to get one treatment, one intervention versus the other, and you have no randomized trials preceding that, and then you do a randomized trial, uh, you're likely to be off by 31% uh, on a odd ratio scale for mortality. Uh, so this is a huge deviation because mortality benefits, if you're lucky, uh, they may be 5%, they may be even 3%, they could make a difference. So 31%, the potential error is much bigger compared to uh, whatever benefit might be there. Are there dramatic enough effects to warrant no randomized data? Just to say, this is so obvious. It's, it's like uh, uh, jumping from an airplane without a parachute. You shouldn't do that. Well, you can very well jump from an airplane without a parachute, and there's even a randomized trial that has randomized people to jump from an airplane without a parachute versus with a parachute, and it found no difference. Why was that? Because the airplane was stationed on the ground when people jump from the airplane. <laughs> so. Um, there are some cases where people say the effect size is so strong that I'm going to say I will never need randomized documentation. We've looked at data from EMA and then also looked at data from uh, FDA approval. So with my uh, good friend and colleague, Ben Dilbekovic, and we found that on average, these settings corresponded to effect sizes from non-randomized evidence of an odds ratio on average of about 12. So yes, these are pretty large, but that 12 was just the average and it varied tremendously. In many cases, the odds ratio was one or even less than one. So how do we survive that misinformation mess? Um, one solution is we trust guidelines. It's too difficult for us. We have very limited time. Uh, how can we find out all the studies and all the glitches and all the biases? Let's have someone do it for us, come up with a guideline. Well, guidelines probably are the least <laughs> trustworthy source of information. Unfortunately, they have become many specialties, marketing tools and potential threats to, to health, both of patients and of public health. Why is that? Because many recommendations that have been out there for a very long time from the National Academy of Medicine and, and many other organizations are not really followed. We still have sponsors who are supporting these guidelines and they have obvious conflicts of interest. We have people who are paid uh, by companies or by stakeholders to come up with specific conclusions. We have Sometimes no obvious financial conflict, but the members of the panel have been picked uh, with a stacking process, which means that someone has looked at what they preach, what they believe, what is the narrative that they endorse, and just cherry pick those who agreed with a particular narrative. You know, is the best way to uh, create a task force for COVID-19 or for anything else. You just get people who agree with you, and and then you have no disagreements. You know, everything is settled. You don't need to do science. You know everything before you do the science. So uh, they are not really trustworthy. We've seen that again and again. Some of them are trustworthy, but it's really the minority, about 10 to 20% of the time. Second option, uh, we have meticulous evidence-based uh, methodologies who come up with uh, assessments of grade. Yes, this takes more time, and it can be incorporated also in guidelines, but in most cases, and most of you who have done grade assessments, you will realize 
that it's not easy. Uh, they have lots of uncertainties. They have quite a bit of subjectivity. At least they give some structure, but uh, it's not necessarily very concrete. And as I said, most of the time, you have very few uh, pieces of evidence that survive with high quality of evidence. The worst situation is when you have professional societies who come up with guidelines and, and assessments. Uh, you have people whose living depends on what these guidelines would say. You know, can you imagine a medical society saying that what we do as a specialty is completely a waste and we should just go home and uh, we don't need to, uh, you don't need to come to us ever to have these procedures or these treatments that we're doing and based on which we're making a living. Unfortunately, this is what's happening in some societies, for example, cardiology, they're highly dependent on financial sponsors. Uh, the American Heart Association, a very prestigious organization is getting more than $200 million every year from industry support. The European Society of Cardiology, 77% of their budget uh, is dependent on industry support. This means that the entire field of cardiology, if you look at their most highly cited papers, are almost always guidelines. Um, exceptions are industry sponsored trials, and there's very, very few that are studies of other sorts. Uh, only 11 out of about 200 uh, most cited classics are other types of studies. In order to fix that situation, we need to think about what are the typical recipes of doing research. Can we somehow change the way that research is done? Most research pertains to limited data, small data research. You have small sample size, you have solo silent investigators and small teams, you have cherry picking of one or best hypotheses, you have post hoc approaches dominating the field, very lenient statistical criteria, no registration, no data sharing, and no replication. You also have the opposite uh, poll, which is a, a recipe of doing research with big data, and we see more of that increasingly in many fields, in, including many fields of, uh, of uh, public health, and you have extremely large sample size, which means overpowered studies. You have cherry picking of uh, one or the best hypotheses. Again, you have lots of post hoc conclusions. More statistics go into these analysis compared to the small studies, but they tend to be idiosyncratic uh, in terms of the structure. They differ from one team to another. There's very little consensus. Again, no registration. And data sharing tends to happen more frequently, but these data are so complex that it's often impossible to understand what exactly is being shared. I've had lots of data sets that are sent to me that it's impossible to read them unless you really sit with uh, whoever sent you the data to try to explain what exactly is shown here, what exactly has been done. Most fields are not sharing. Uh, this is an empirical evaluation where we looked at the most highly cited uh, papers in psychology and in psychiatry, and we invited their corresponding authors to share the data, and we told them that we don't want any money. We will do all the curation work to make these data available for uh, everyone in the scientific community, and it just didn't work. Uh, we had uh, a few cases where uh, we did get some of that information, but uh, most of the time, no primary data would be shared. It was not that the researchers were still using their data. It was not that um, um, they were reluctant to share. They just couldn't share. Most of the data were outside of the primary investigators' controls. For example, for industry-sponsored trials, the principal investigators do not have control of the data. And very often, they have not even seen the data. Very often, it's just the sponsor who is sending them an analysis and they just put their name in it. I mean, they make editorial changes, they craft part of the manuscript and the discussion, but they have never seen the data. And we saw that very prominently in the COVID-19 era with papers published in The Lancet, for example, on hydroxychloroquine, supposedly coming from uh, hundreds of sites around the world, the worth of data. You had a, a great professor from Harvard putting his name as first author and then it was realized that this data did not really exist and the, the paper had to be retracted. Of course, it's not fraud. I think that in most situations, these are valid efforts. These are reliable, uh, trustworthy data, but it's, it's really sad and, and worrisome if the principal investigators have not seen the data, they have no control on the data. There's a push to share more and some fields have realized that this is a good idea. For example, in public health genomics, uh, we published that uh, paper, uh, less than two years ago where we advocated that unrestricted use of public data uh, should be the norm. Uh, 
you need to come up with a very good reason to have an exception to that happening. Better statistics and methods could also help uh, in that chaos. Um, transparent and hopefully registered statistical analysis plans, especially if it's not an exploratory analysis. If it's an exploratory analysis, the only thing that I expect is that someone would say, this is an exploratory analysis. Statistical training and improved literacy and numeracy of the scientific workforce. That would be ideal, but it will take a lot of time. Better study designs, standard features, for example, randomization and blinding of investigators in animal experiments is so easy to do, but we know that it's not being done. Uh, when it comes to more complex studies, uh, maybe it's a, a bit more difficult, but again, it is not done. Checklists, can they save the world? Uh, they can help. There's lots of checklists out there, and some of them may help uh, improve some of the standardization process, but they're not the final answer. Uh, and I, I think that uh, uh, we need to think how to intervene at the stage of designing studies rather than just uh, wait for the reporting of studies. Computational methods. A lot of public health is depending increasingly on very complex, very non-transparent reproducibility, uh, non-reproducible computational methods. Uh, uh, four years ago, we published that paper in Science where we came up with some guidance on how to enhance the reproducibility of computational methods. I think some progress has been made since then, but we still have a long way to go. The major challenge is that there is a trade-off between transparency and complexity in, in much of that uh, computational space. Uh, some of the most promising models are the least transparent. They're very complex, and that means that uh, if you really want to say what exactly was done, you really need to be very careful and provide information for each and every one of the nodes and the decision steps that were taken on how that particular modeling would be implemented. Uh, a couple of months ago, along with several colleagues, we published a paper uh, in Nature uh, as a matters arising paper where we go through steps on how artificial intelligence models could become more transparent and you can get some more safeguards for reproducibility in the process. Reporting standards, I mentioned those already. We have about 300 different reporting standards. I think they do help, but as I said, there's a new wave of uh, reporting of, of standards that focus more on the design rather than just the reporting. By the time you have finished the study, it may be a bit too late to try to improve it in meaningful ways. And finally, my pet, meta research, which means trying to do science on science, how to evaluate and improve research methods and practices. That means lots of different things. It, it means how we perform research, how we communicate research, how we verify research, how we evaluate research, and how we reward research. And I think that um, uh, each one of them is a very promising field of doing empirical studies to see where we are, where we're heading, how can we change some of practices and improve things. And we have to worry about making things worse if we don't really have reliable evidence. There's many opportunities uh, because uh, research is like a, a perpetuating uh, cycle that starts from generating and specifying hypotheses, designing studies, conducting these studies and collecting data, analyzing the data and testing hypotheses, interpreting the results and publishing uh, these results and conducting the next experiment. Uh, and there are opportunities at each one of these steps to intervene and to try to avoid some of the biases and some of the shortcomings that are making our life difficult. These are some uh, possibilities uh, uh, that we discussed in a review paper that uh, we published uh, three years ago. Uh, and to do this, you need to think of how to re-engineer the reward system. I think that currently we pay a lot of attention to productivity. Uh, so, you know, numbers of papers or numbers of citations. I have nothing against productivity. I, I love writing. I, I'm, I'm a maniac uh, <laughs> writing papers, <laughs> but uh, it's not enough. We, we need to give additional priority to quality, to reproduction ability to sharing and to translational impact. Uh, and this reads like an electrocardiogram, PQRST. Uh, we need to reward people who pay more attention to quality, to uh, making sure that they share and they allow the reproducibility of their work. And when it comes to public health, translational impact, of course, is paramount importance. It's not just curiosity. It's about lives, lives of, of people, 
lives of populations. Sometimes we're talking about millions of lives being at stake. So how do we prioritize our reward system for promotion, for uh, funding, uh, for tenure in, in universities to align uh, with these goals? Uh, we published a paper in the BMJ uh, several months ago with David Moher and his team where we looked at the uh, promotion criteria across different medical schools. And we saw very few criteria were really aligned with that vision. So there's plenty of room to grow in that direction. And finally, we need to understand and align the interests of multiple stakeholders. Uh, science is done by scientists, but there's also lots of other players. There's industry, and when we talk about industry, we need to separate between their R&D and their sales and marketing. And most industries, unfortunately, they have far more powerful sales and marketing compared to R&D. We need to take into account private funders, public funders, uh, non-for-profit uh, philanthropists, uh, uh, general editors, for-profit publishers, uh, professional and scientific societies, universities, not-for-profit uh, research institutions, supporting uh, non-scientific staff, uh, hospitals, uh, other professional faculties, facilities that offer services related uh, to science uh, and public health, other financial entities that may be affected, like insurance companies, governments, federal authorities, uh, counties, states, uh, politicians, uh, and all of us, uh, when it comes to public health, all of us are affected. So different players have very different priorities. Some of them just want to publish papers. Others want to get funded. Some want to see things translated into things that work. And some want to make profit. And nothing is to be blamed necessarily, provided that we can find a way that eventually we save lives, that eventually we get it right, that eventually we make public health better. For all of us. To conclude, is evidence-based public health dead? Um, well, I, I think it's still alive, but clearly it's not well. Uh, there are many potential improvements in the evidence base. Methods matter. Research practices matter. And incentives also matter. I hope we can get things better. I'm trying. I think I'm failing all the time, but I'm sure you will do better. Thank you. So thank you, thank you very much. This was uh, excellent. Uh, thank you for a wonderful uh, lecture. There's quite a lot to unpack there. Uh, so uh, we will now uh, uh, continue with uh, discussion. Um, uh, in order to encourage our audience to submit their questions, I'm now going to open uh, the chat box so you can uh, all submit your questions um, in the chat as well besides uh, our email and I would like to start with uh, a question submitted by one of our students uh, to you uh, about uh, evidence-based uh, medicine itself if if the problem is not evidence-based medicine but uh, the way it is conducted how are we uh, going to um, ensure that is uh, that these tools are going to be uh, applied uh, judiciously? And uh, maybe we could uh, use the example of systematic reviews. So if everyone can do a systematic review and use these tools, how are we supposed as scientists to guard against misuse of these tools? Systematic reviews are, are a great idea, and they're clearly an Im improvement versus uh, previous expert-based reviews. Uh, th they introduced uh, a, a revolution uh, several decades ago when they started. They, they got a lot of uh, uh, attention and uh, a, a lot of attacks, uh, but now they have become established. It's, it's just uh, uh, very easy. Uh, we have several hundreds uh, of thousands of systematic reviews or, or, or reviews that claim to be systematic, to be honest, <laughs> uh, because some of them are not really systematic. And we have more than 100,000 meta-analyses that, that have been published. But as I showed you, most of them are very suboptimal. And uh, there are multiple layers of problems. Of course, the primary evidence is something that we need to worry. And uh, we need to improve the primary evidence if we want ever to have systematic reviews that can tell us a little bit more other than just uh, the evidence is very poor. <laughs> um, worse, many systematic reviews are telling us the evidence is not poor, 
it's very strong or you know here you have a an effect size with a p value that uh, you know glitters like gold uh, and then people jump and say this is final this is perfect uh, and and this is enough and i think that this is even worse so as i said it's a multi step process and you can make improvements at all stages you can make stages at the design of the research agenda at generating the primary evidence at performing these systematic reviews at interpreting these systematic reviews at writing guidelines at having these guidelines implemented uh, I, I will take offers for improving any of these steps and of course all of these steps needs to be need to be improved it's not just one that will save the world so thank you let me pass the floor to Alexandros for a few more questions thank you Theodore so, uh, Professor Ioannidis, thanks again for the great presentation. It was really uh, an eye-opener. I mean, it's, it was uh, really, really useful for everyone. So, we cannot see any questions at the moment. So, I have one of... Ah, maybe... Ah, okay. So, we have one from a colleague, actually. I was about to ask mine, but let's go with uh, Dr. Lamnisos's question. So, I'm reading from the chat. There is a trend of using machine learning, computational methods, and big data methods in health and public health. What is your opinion about the potential usefulness of those methods in evidence-based public health in the future? So you can also see the question, uh, Professor Anidis, in the chat. If you want me to repeat it, uh, I would be more than happy to do so. Uh, we seem to have lost connection with uh, Professor Ioannidis. Okay. Uh, I think he is reconnecting. Okay, let's wait a bit. So until uh, Professor Ioannidis joins, uh, I would encourage our students to, to ask questions. I mean, there is nothing, you know, there, there is no bad question, you know, it's uh, anything, even if you think that something may be obvious and you don't feel comfortable asking, I mean, you, you can do so. It's uh, absolutely fine. It's a friendly environment. So we have one. Okay, Sava, uh, hopefully uh, Professor Anides will join soon, so we will uh, pass your question. Thanks for doing it. Uh, Theodore, I'm not sure if we have, uh, maybe via email, if we can contact uh, Professor Anides. Uh, I am. Uh, I was just about to do the same. Although I see him right. Ah, he he's back. I think. I think he's joining. Yeah. Uh, I got disconnected. Uh, yeah, we figured. Uh, so n never mind. Glad to have you with us. So please, uh, Alexander. Uh, if I can get the video to work. Um, yeah. Okay. okay. Yes. Great. Okay. Great. Great. Uh, no, this is never. <laughs> no worries, no worries. We, we actually had the chance to talk a bit with our guests so that they, they come up with a few questions. So no, no problem at all. Uh, I don't know, Professor Anides, if you, if you had heard the question, I read it out, but I think it was the phase where you were disconnecting. I can repeat it. Yes. And you can also check it in the chat uh, as well yourself, but uh, of course I can read it out again. Is yeah. from uh, our colleague, uh, Dr. Dimitris Lamnisos. 
So let's go. There is a trend of using machine learning, comp computational methods and big data methods in health and public health. What is your opinion about the potential usefulness of those methods in evidence-based public health in the future? Fascinating developments, uh, great potential. Uh, I never say no to better methods. Uh, I use some of these methods myself or, or, or misuse them <laughs> perhaps uh, at times. Uh, but, but we have to be very careful about what are the strengths and weaknesses of, of each method. In, in most cases, uh, the problem is not so much our computational machinery. The, the problems are very traditional kind of prehistoric <laughs> problems of, of just traditional clinical epidemiology. If, if you have a wooden cart, if you put a Lamborghini engine in it, this is, this is not going to run at, at 500 kilometers per hour. And, and most of the time, I see these very sophisticated tools thrown at data that are so suboptimal, so weak, so error prone, so misleading that, that you know, you just give a, a haze of, uh, wow, I'm, I'm using a very fancy machine learning method and therefore the, the conclusions are going to be strong. No, the conclusions are going to be weak. They're going to be dismally weak if, if the data uh, are, are very weak and, and if the, the structure that these data are collected is very weak. To make things worse, I think that much of that machine learning community has absolutely no background in traditional epidemiology, clinical epidemiology, uh, research design. I, I see lots of papers that have very limited or no information about some of the key features that, that would be critical to, to ensure that there are there uh, before you start using these powerful methods. So we need to communicate more. We need to cross link uh, different types of expertise I'm great that we have more uh, tools to use, but, but just thinking that these tools are going to save the day, no, I think that in many cases they make things just horrible. Uh, let me interject here with another related question. Uh, it is about modeling. So you were uh, almost, uh, may I say, almost dismissive of uh, epidemic modeling and uh, you even called it speculation at its worst and uh, <laughs> in fact uh, I tend to mostly agree with you but uh, nevertheless I wonder do you see any chance to save modeling like uh, for example if we use it uh, for very conservatively uh, like to uh, assess different scenarios or maybe maybe to use only for short-term predictions or monitoring than long-term effects. So any chance that modeling can be useful? Well, I think that this doesn't mean that modeling should be dismissed completely. And uh, I, I refer you back to uh, that paper uh, in uh, International Journal of Forecasting, where we end up with making suggestions on how to revert or avoid uh, or bypass some of, of these biases and shortcomings that I read to you. So each of these shortcomings, if you're aware of them, you can do something to try to minimize them. Uh, so you can improve data, you can avoid selective reporting, you can get expertise across the board, you can be very careful with depicting the uncertainty of the model, you can try alternatives to see how robust the conclusions are, you can have validation, you can have sharing, you can have reproducibility, you know, all of that will make things better. And if you place your expectations at the right level, then I, I think modeling should continue to exist. What I worry is that that modeling has, has been kind of uh, deified at, at the moment. And there's just too many modelers. And most of those have no clue about what they're doing. I mean, honestly, <laughs> they have no clue what they're doing. So I, I, I think that, um, if you solve these problems, modeling does have a future. And this is what we conclude in that paper. Conversely, there's another paper in that very same issue by Nassim Taleb, which is kind of a, uh, the opposite poll. Uh, we had these papers side by side, kind of a debate. In the beginning of the debate, we said, we're going to take the position that modeling really is horrible. And Nassim Taleb will take the position that modeling is, is great. And uh, at the end, uh, he said that modeling is always bad <laughs> in a way. And we said, no, it is bad, but it can be fixed, at least to some extent. So I, I don't want to dismiss modeling. I do modeling myself. I, I'm sure that I have produced my own horrible models <laughs> now and then. 
but it can be done better. I, th I think it can really be done better and we can place expectations at the right level. Uh, let me also ask you another question about uh, saving uh, something before I pass on uh, to Alexandros again for our audience questions. Uh, about guidelines, so you um, uh, said that uh, guidelines are often used as a marketing tool, especially uh, those uh, guidelines offered by professional societies. And uh, full disclose uh, here, uh, I have worked uh, as a great methodologist for a European professional society. So uh, I wonder if you think there is any chance to save uh, guidelines uh, and their liability, particularly by applying grade. I fully understand the tensions and uh, as uh, someone who was uh, who should instruct uh, experts to work with grade, I appreciate the tensions, but do you think that uh, it is hopeless. Uh, can we have good guidelines that can, are actually informative? So guidelines do have a role, and uh, uh, if, if they are functional, if they are appropriate, if they are unbiased, uh, they can help. Um, if, if you take a random sample, I would say about 80% of the guidelines that circulate in the market at the moment, they have one or more red flags based on our BMJ list of, of red flags that make them pretty unreliable. But about 20% of them are fine. And again, we need to try to find ways to increase that proportion and also make their impact larger compared to those that have very obvious red flag problems. Grade is a machinery that could help. And I, I think that on average, societies and organizations that have adopted grade, on average, they're doing a better job compared to those that have not. Uh, but grade alone will not save the day because if you don't take care of all the other steps, for example, the creation of the panel, the stacking, the, the conflicts of interest, you can have guidelines that use grade and, and still get you a very erroneous message. So it, it's not hopeless. Uh, we have good guidelines. We have some excellent guidelines. Uh, but I, I think we need to fight to get their proportion to be higher in the overall uh, universe of, of guidelines that are circulating out there. Thank you, Alexandre. Yeah. Okay. So let's move to the next question from our uh, audience. Uh, so Savas Michael Amigdalos um, is asking uh, about a, a very hot topic, of course. So um, Michael is asking, what is the evidence data right now in, uh, in case of the major issue of side effects that are derived from COVID-19? vaccine related also with allergies so probably in other words what is the evidence telling us about that and uh, probably is also asking about the the quality of this evidence or your uh, perception about the quality of this evidence coming about vaccine uh, uh, side effects in particular yes so uh, goodness i mean we, we, we could easily spend uh, five hours on this but the, the, the short answer is that the evidence is what it is uh, for now uh, for uh, vaccines that uh, were developed very quickly, very successfully, I have to say, an amazing scientific feat, and which have very limited follow-up. You know, we have randomized trials, phase three trials. They were pretty decent, and they show a very good safety profile within the narrow time frame of these uh, randomized trials. We also have some evidence from those people who have been vaccinated so far um, close to 200 million doses have been given uh, so far, at least uh, for the, the two vaccines that uh, had the uh, early emergency authorization. So we have some evidence. I would say the evidence is such that I would not say that uh, people should withhold vaccination because of concerns of toxicity. But do we have the complete picture? No, we don't have the complete picture. We need to keep collecting information and evidence both on the real world effectiveness uh, and we start having some data from Israel at the moment, as well as the long-term safety and large-scale population level safety. So um, I, I, I think that um, there are concerns that have been expressed. We need to watch them very carefully. I think it's inappropriate to say that we know everything about these vaccines and uh, uh, we should just give them a blank check. Uh, they have received emergency authorizations, which means we have a major crisis. We need to use them right away but this is not equivalent to full licensing. 
So it, it, I think it, it would be just offering ammunition to the anti-vaxxers and the anti-vaccine movement if we just say that we know everything. We don't know everything. We're still collecting information, but what we know suggests that uh, vaccination should hopefully help and should continue. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So moving on to the next uh, guest question. So Alambanis Ioannis, uh, I would like to know your opinion about medical confidentiality and access of private companies in sensitive medical data. What, was, what is your prediction slash opinion about the future? So medical confidentiality and access of private companies in sensitive medical data. I don't uh, want to maybe, make maybe here uh, it would be useful to add uh, the example of Israel, uh, which has generated a lot of controversy, uh, both uh, in favor of Israel's approach to share this data with the companies and against. Exactly. Yes. So uh, we are seeing a very rapidly shifting landscape, uh, and I cannot make predictions in 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 this regard because there's so many stakeholders and some of them they're so powerful but also uh, changing their perspectives and their priorities over time that it's very unpredictable where we would be I, th I think that there's a major tension one is that you want to do your best to maximize uh, privacy and confidentiality and respect the wishes of, of people of citizens to not have information leaked uh, at the same time as i said i'm in favor of data sharing uh, because I think that this enables better transparency, more reproducibility, uh, more trust in the information and, and better information. So we have tools that can allow us to do both. Uh, we have tools that have improved our ability to de-identify. We have tools that allow for securing transfer of data in ways that uh, you, you maintain the confidentiality within the space that is intended. Um, I, I think it's an issue of how do we optimize the balance between these two worlds and use the tools that we have in, in the most appropriate way. Uh, I do worry, even though I'm a very fervent supporter of open data and sharing data about uh, an invasion of privacy. I do worry a lot about that. Uh, and I, I worry even more because much of that invasion is happening entirely outside research. Uh, it, it's not research, it's not even something that has a public health orientation you know, or, or saving lives or improving lives. It's something that, that some very powerful tech companies have every reason to try to get information so that they can make more money. Uh, and I think that some of the conflicts compared to, let's say, pharma, big pharma conflicts or big food conflicts are going to become much stronger because some of these high tech companies are far more powerful than the previous players. So we have to watch very carefully on what they do, how they try to do that, how they sneer sometimes private citizens into sharing their information, sometimes without even them knowing that they're sharing everything about their lives. Um, so I, I don't, I don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist <laughs> because many of these high tech companies, they have amazing advantages uh, for all of us. But, uh, but we have to be very careful about what are the boundaries uh, and how do we secure that we, we all get the best out of, uh, of these developments? Okay, great. Thank you very much, Professor Ioannidis. Let's move on to the next question from our colleague, uh, Konstantinos Yanagou. So let's go, umbrella reviews, parentheses, meta research, research studies were conducted over the last years in many different research fields to summarize the evidence derived from many systematic reviews and meta-analysis. After applying their credibility criteria, only a minority of included associations had strongly significant results with no suggestion of bias, as can be inferred by substantial heterogeneity between studies, small study effects, and excess significant bias. What could be the next step? Could be these research studies, could these these studies be utilized? Do you have any experience on this? Or I, I would add any opinion uh, on this? So meta uh, umbrella yeah. uh, reviews. Umbrella reviews. Uh, I, I, I think I've done many umbrella reviews by now. I, I, I actually introduced the concept of, of umbrella reviews uh, uh, many years ago uh, to have a fair sense of what that looks like. 
uh, umbrella reviews most of the time are saying most of the evidence is not very strong. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's just taking that statement that we see very often in plain systematic reviews to the higher level of having multiple systematic reviews. Again, concluding that most of the evidence is, is not really convincing uh, or even highly suggestive. It's very weak. It has problems. It has uncertainty. And uh, we have to be very careful. Um, is that useful? I, th I think it is useful. It just gives us a sense of the landscape of where we are, uh, what do we have, uh, what kind of information and evidence we have collected, where do we have the most prominent gaps, uh, what might be some best next moves, and uh, what should we do in terms of using that evidence uh, for applications or for decisions. So it, it is... Um, the, the challenges are the same as for plain systematic reviews, but kind of exponentiated, because now you don't have just one systematic reviews, but 50, 100, uh, 300 systematic reviews that, that you, to try to amalgamate and take a look uh, in, a, in a bird's eye fashion. Uh, useful, but, but not definitive. And I have to say that the criteria for saying what is uh, convincing and suggestive and, and weak, th these are criteria that I developed a long time ago. And, they may well be wrong. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not saying that, that they're conclusive by, by any means. These criteria are just a, a set of things that are sensible to check and pretty objective to, to check, you know, like amount of evidence, consistency of results, presence of hints uh, of bias. Um, there could be lots of other things that are missing. It, it, it's not like the entire picture about the evidence. Okay, great. So, uh, Theodore, you you want to go ahead with uh, the next one? Yes. Uh, let me continue with uh, another question, and I would like to uh, return to uh, public health. Uh, and uh, I fully agree with you that uh, we need more, uh, uh, far more, actually, randomized control trials in public health matters, uh, especially in uh, a pandemic situation. But uh, I would like your opinion as to why uh, we don't have uh, more public health question. Is it the nature of the question? Is it uh, something about the uh, motivations of different stakeholders? I mean, uh, drug companies probably are very strongly motivated to run randomized control trial of drugs. So is it uh, the motivation? Is it uh, the prominence of uh, evidence-based medicine? Why do we have? don't we have? And how could we have more RCTs for public health matters? I, I think it's uh, it's more like a plebiscite of, of stakeholders. We just have too many stakeholders who have no clue about randomized trials. They completely misunderstand what, what randomized trials are. Uh, they know nothing or they know very little about them. And uh, they feel a sense of urgency, you know, well-intentioned urgency, that they need to respond. I don't have time to waste uh, with with experiments and you know the misconception oh so you're going to make the population into guinea pigs um, so I, I think it's it's the the general environment that does not facilitate that situation and uh, I have examples of trials that were very carefully designed they did manage to get buy-in from key stakeholders including from uh, government uh, for example for school closures and openings in in Norway and then at the last moment they would not happen. Uh, you know, th there were times that everybody was so scared that even saying, I'm going to do an experiment of uh, closing or keeping schools open or, or reopening, uh, you know, versus uh, keeping them closed, no one would, would want to do this. And, and then there were times that people said, what, you're going to close schools again? That's completely ridiculous. <laughs> you cannot randomize to, to close versus uh, keep open. So uh, somehow, we're kind of tossed uh, around by this sort of, 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 of media framed opinions and, and this sense of, of panic and, and toxic fear and uh, uh, politicians feel compelled to just act without <laughs> evidence, if anything, which is, which is really the worst that can happen. I, I think that we need some people to be honest, to say, I'm sorry, I don't know. I'm, I'm just telling you nonsense on how to deal with a pandemic. 
but you're an expert, you're Professor X. No, I'm talking nonsense. And if you let me appear again in your television or in your newspaper on, or in your task force, I will just keep talking nonsense until I get that more reliable evidence. Can we please get a little bit more reliable evidence? <laughs> How many people are going to do that? You know, most people enjoy being in the limelight and, uh, you know, being task force members and a little bit of a dictator of everybody's life with no evidence. You know, it sounds, you know, sounds very boosting to egos. Well, uh, but uh, do you think it's more about the politicians who are reluctant or even maybe the scientists? And uh, I would um, uh, do a plug here and I will uh, submit to you my uh, very recent small experience uh, in talking to uh, several uh, people in uh, Greece, uh, uh, some of the key uh, people, scientific scientists people, uh, about uh, school closures. Uh, I actually proposed the idea now during the current lockdown to have a randomized control trial of uh, school closures. It could be actually very easy if the decision is made to close down some schools, we might as well close some of them and uh, not close the other uh, half. But uh, uh, what uh, impressed me the most was the sense of resignation by the scientists who have to interact with the government. Yeah, so no, it's, it's, not, it's not politicians. I mean, politicians, they know nothing. Uh, they're supposed to know nothing about the topic, isn't it? I mean, they, they may be archeologists or they may be lawyers or they may be, who knows, you know, why should we expect them? to know about public health or, or about uh, specifically COVID-19 or about specifically whatever uh, is uh, pertinent to medicine. They should not, they're not expected to know. So I think, yes, it does come back to scientists and it comes back to what is the training of scientists, what is their, their mentality, uh, how much they know about evidence-based medicine, about the need to get proper evidence and, uh, and evidence that, that matters. Uh, and and I, unfortunately, Everything, you know, from our educational system all the way to teaching how to do research to how to prioritize uh, types of designs and questions is not in favor of doing this. Uh, so uh, somehow we are stuck. We're, we're paying the price of scientific illiteracy and innumeracy and in evidence-based training within the scientific workforce in an acute situation. And we pay a high price in this acute situation. We have been paying this price for decades, but now we pay a high acute price because it's an acute situation. So, so you, you uh, uh, said, you talked about scientific illiteracy among the scientists. Uh, so quite provocative there, but still I would like to uh, ask another question. You also mentioned about uh, uh, different uh, specialties in science and in public health. Uh, being uh, siloed and having little to no communication with each other. And we also see that during the current pandemic. I mean, you have uh, infectious disease people and epidemiologists. You have uh, clinicians and uh, public health people. You have uh, chemists doing uh, extremely interesting work about uh, COVID in sewers and uh, epidemiologists and so on. How can these start, uh, how can these people actually communicate? Is it the motives? Is it just, how can we improve their communication? Everybody is needed. I mean, we need all these specialties. We need all disciplines. I would argue we need far more disciplines than have been involved. For example, you need mathematical sociologists. You need uh, uh, behavioral economists. You, you need uh, operational research uh, people. You need uh, crisis management uh, specialists. You, you need uh, psychologists and psychiatrists. Uh, you need the behavior change specialists. You, so it's not just epidemiology and infectious diseases and, and chemical engineering, which is what you typically see. And, and I have to say, epidemiology, you, you don't really see much. I mean, there's very few epidemiologists, really epidemiologists, who are involved in, in most of these task forces. Usually it's clinicians, uh, infectious disease clinicians. And I say that even though my, my clinical specialty is infectious diseases, uh, which is very different from, from what you really need, which is a conglomerate of multiple domains, multiple disciplines, multiple types of, of expertise to be able to cross communicate. It's not easy, but unless we have all of these people be able to cross communicate and convey what each of these disciplines knows and does not know, we will not get very far. But public health needs to be holistic. 
it's not just one specialty. It needs to look at people in the WHO definition of health. It's not just one type of health outcome that uh, we should worry about. We should worry about health in its totality. And this is structured integrally within many other types of, of human activities. So un unless we do that, we're very short-sighted. And, and uh, uh, I cannot give more advice other than just try to get as many uh, people and as much diversity into these deliberations and these discussions to try to hear about complementary views that may get you uh, closer to, to a, a more responsible response. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, we are uh, ra starting to run a bit late, but uh, if you would uh, be so kind uh, as to spend a few more minutes with us, uh, I would I'll give the floor back to Alexandros for more questions. Okay, you, I'm, I'm teaching a course uh, right after the session, so it, it cannot be very long, but I'm, I'm very happy to okay. answer a few questions. So let, let's say maybe five minutes, Professor Anidis, yes, uh, would that be, be okay? Of Excellent. course. So I'll make a quick question myself and then uh, maybe one more from the audience, uh, Theodore, and I think we can wrap yes. up after that. Yes. Great. So I will kind of link my question that I, I had in mind uh, uh, the past half hour or so with what you have been now discussing with Theodoros. So my initial question had to do about uh, uh, open access. Of course, it's obvious that you are in favor not just of open access uh, publications, but also openly sharing data and raw data, etc., which is I totally agree, and that's great. But the current uh, reality, as you know much better than, uh, than I do, is that there are still a lot of journals that uh, are behind a paywall. And yes, there are some kind of um, developments with more and more journals uh, opening up, but again, this usually comes with, uh, you know, substantial uh, publication fees. So uh, the first part I would say is where do you see that going? I mean, uh, I mean, we really trust your, let's say, um, uh, gut feeling <laughs> about this. Uh, do you ever see it actually becoming? Uh, totally uh, open access, I mean, research in general, the next, let's say, five years, or is it something totally out of the question? That's my I, first I, part. I, I think that I cannot make predictions uh, five years from, from <laughs> now, but uh, in principle, I'm in favor of open access, and I think that there are initiatives that are trying to make it the default. There were plans for do doing that in the EU, for example, uh, and they're still being debated uh, to some extent. Many journals are shifting in that direction. I think we'll see more and more will be all open access. I don't know. I cannot promise you that. But um, I, I worry that open access is just uh, one frontier that is not necessarily the most important. Because if let's say you have an open access journal and, and you can read all the papers and you can download the papers and, and read them. Most of these papers are just advertisements. You know, it's an advertisement that I did this research. Trust me. Uh, the data are not there, the code is not there, the mm. methods are very sketchy. So you cannot really recreate, you just have to trust the advertisement that uh, this was research that was done. And uh, with complex research, like modeling <laughs> and, and many other types of complex research, that advertisement is entirely cryptic. So uh, it, it's, uh, it's not going to save the, the key problem of lack of transparency, just making these papers open access in terms of uh, whether you need to pay a subscription fee to access them or not. Yeah. So the key is basically open access to, to data. Uh, I, I, I understand. Methods. And the second, methods, yeah. methods and data. So total transparency, very clear. Uh, the second part, which could be a comment. I mean, if we don't have time for an answer, that's absolutely fine. Uh, I mean, for me, the, since we have touched a bit uh, upon the pandemic, uh, a disappointment, I would say, is, is the lack of trust of the public uh, towards uh, the scientific community. I mean, for me, that was heartbreaking to realize. I mean, we are all kind of behind our laptops and excited about doing research. And then this comes and uh, it, it throws to our face how, how low is the confidence of the public. And this has to be linked somehow to 
uh, you know, publishing openly. It, it doesn't mean that the public will go and read our articles, but uh, generally I think it would help uh, to be more transparent. And I don't know if you have a, a comment there and uh, we can have another question and, and wrap up. That's that's a very, very difficult question. Um, and even to phrase it <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. and let alone to answer it. I, I think that during the pandemic, uh, the general public was just given a bolus of science. You know, all of a sudden, they were getting a little bit of science here and there, especially for some topics like nutrition. Most of that was actually substandard, unfortunately, because it was like, like the weakest types of science that was being communicated uh, more prominently to the public. And now suddenly you have an acute situation where you have dozens and hundreds of thousands of scientists speaking and speaking and, and telling people what to do and how to change their lives and, and how they're going to die and, and, and how we are in a crisis. And you cannot teach 7.7 .7 billion people science overnight or in 15 days or in one month. I mean, you cannot even teach scientists <laughs> science overnight or within, within a few years. So, so that's, that's where the crisis comes. You have easily consumable, quote unquote, science digested and processed and, and tossed around by billions of people. Uh, it's a unique opportunity because we want to have science being relevant for all of us. I mean, that's amazing, but it, it can really backfire if we get it wrong. So, so we have a nice opportunity. It's a teaching moment in a sense. And now we will see how good teachers we are. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. I'm a very poor Thank you. I'm afraid. <laughs> no, no. We're I really have to run for the next course. People want to listen to me. Goodness. Uh, the, why do they want that? <laughs> so just one short uh, final uh, question uh, before we close. Uh, a, a, a rather vague question, but still interesting uh, from our audience. Evidence-based versus value-based. Please tell us your opinion. Maybe I would uh, rephrase that or as uh, is there any actual tension between evidence or values? There, there shouldn't be. Uh, in, in the very early definition of evidence-based medicine, you need to understand values. Uh, so if you want to make decisions, values are essential. Evidence-based medicine is not going to tell you that this is exactly what you need to do and you're going to do it regardless of what your value system is. You need to have shared um, decision-making uh, with the stakeholders, uh, you know, patients, in public health populations. Tell them what is your values. You know what, what do you prefer? Uh, some people may prefer to die. Well, I'm not telling that that's a good idea. We should try to change our mind. <laughs> but <laughs> they they might say, I want to drink a cup of coffee and then die. Um, ooh, okay, that sounds. Uh, can we change your mind? Because this doesn't sound very logical. But many other values are really to be balanced and to be very carefully balanced. And I I think we should avoid imposing evidence as this is what's going to save you. We need both. We need evidence and we need values and we need careful, transparent, shared decision making. I think that was an excellent response. I hope uh, our uh, member of the audience thinks that too. Uh, with that, we would like to thank you very much for this session. We are uh, uh, exactly 10 minutes overdue, so I hope we did not uh, meet. Um, uh, we have made good use of your time. Thank you very much. It's been a great honor and pleasure. A million thanks for the kind invitation. And I look forward to seeing you in Cyprus one day soon. <laughs> You're more Thank than you welcome. very much. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. 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 And thank you to, the, to our audience as well. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone.